Hi and welcome to this podcast with me, Gita Joshi. I'm here today talking to street artist Andrea Tiramas. Welcome, Andrea. Hiya, hi Gita. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. Pleased to be good. chatting with you today. Good. It's an early Sunday morning, isn't it? But never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leery eyes. <laughs> Um, so why don't you tell us a bit about your work actually first because mo- I know you more as a street artist but obviously you have this other exhibition or other artwork, body of work that you produce that is more um, gallery based I guess but t- talk me through some of the street art first. Yeah um, so the street art, it's funny, it's funny to sort of call myself a street artist because I don't I don't really consider myself a street artist. Oh, I sort okay. of sorry, my mistake. I do, no, 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 not your mistake at all. It's just my own. It's kind of I feel like I'm an artist that happens to occasionally paint on the street, as opposed to. But it's just in terms of I suppose the stuff I use to paint on the streets isn't what you would traditionally associate street artists with, perhaps. Um, yeah, that that kind of that happened. I mean, the way that that started was um so when I was at uni at St Martin's we were given the theme of play so it was how can we make our whatever we were doing more playful so I was a painter at the time mm-hmm. and I was thinking god how am I going to do this how how am I going to make a painting playful like it's not something you'd associate with paintings as you would maybe with more installation based work or computer work or what have you and then I kind of came up with this idea of making my painting camouflage into its background at the time we were doing this really we had this um, amazing space at Trinity Boy Wolf in East London and I was really fascinated by this really cool kind of warehousey underground area that had this really amazing brickwork that was full of character so I kind of took it upon myself to blend the painting into its surroundings and then it kind of turned into this thing of find the painting so it was kind of really playful. People had to kind of go on a hunt for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really just grew from that. Um, so I became really fascinated with environments and the walls that surround us. And I kind of see walls almost as wrinkles on a person's face. Like, you know, the, whether it's something someone's carved in or stuck a bit of chewing gum or a poster had been there or it had been weathered by the rain. So I thought it really tells the history of an environment. And then funny story, so that kind of... I always wanted to take that further. I always wanted to kind of go on the streets of London and expand yeah. that project. But I finished uni and kind of life takes over, kind of commissioned works came in and other themes of work developed. But then the reason that that ended up happening was I actually had a studio fire um, where a lot of my work was destroyed and the studio, it was uninhabitable mm-hmm. for a while. Oh. So I then kind of thought, where am I? As well. That was no, that was um, in my studio in North London, okay. which is still where I yeah, still where I'm based today. So there was a, quite a period of time where I couldn't work. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'll finally do, I'll finally do that work that I've been, you know, that's kind of sat on the back burner for a while. So I kind of went onto the streets. I put blank canvases up on the walls, mm-hmm. camouflaged them into their surroundings, and then it's that thing of taking them out of their context. But yeah, it kind of that's where it, it that's where it grew. Um, it's definitely developed since then. I've been able to paint in some really great spaces: the Oxo Tower with Boys People Art Fair, um, Barbican Centre, just on the um, Hoxton Hotel. But oh. now it's kind of yeah. So, but now it's kind of um, developed into more environmental pieces um, as well, where I'm kind of looking into creating pieces to promote clean air in London um, and less pollution. So that kind of started with a telephone box that I did on Southampton Row in Bloomsbury. Um, and that was in association with a social enterprise called Public Space Jam. And now that's something that I'm continuing. So I just literally, maybe not even a month ago, I painted some pieces um, on Whitecross Street in Islington. And that was outside a housing association um, called Tash Court. Um, so I'm very big on art for the people and art should be accessible for everyone. So yeah, that's so kind of... That painting, um, is that right then? You are painting straight onto the walls themselves or are you then or applying something to the, you know, painting to the wall? A bit of both, a bit of both. Um, but sometimes I'll take a blank canvas, pop it up on the wall and camouflage it in so I'm not actually touching the wall. 
But now what I'm tend to also moving towards is painting directly onto the walls for permanent permanent pieces of public art. So whether that's been commissioned through the council or, or whether it's directly through the people or what what have you. I mean it all in oils because I'm a mad woman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All in oils. <laughs> this was I found really surprising as well. It's like you're actually there with um, you know, oils and all of that, right? Rather than spray cans, which is what we traditionally associate with that. How much yeah. how long does um that take and how, how does that work? Because if you're layering it up, the time to dry it, how safe is that given it's often outdoors? Yeah, just it's it's a bit crazy. It's just kind of it started with that was just what I was used to. So I just thought, well, I <laughs> I'm an oil painter. I, I I just thought, well, rather than try and learn something else, I want to kind of stick to my craft. I feel like I've honed that craft for many years. Um but for me, it kind of works. I mean, it takes a long time. So for the phone box, for example, I was there every single day, including weekends for a month. Um, and that was in January. And at the time it was raining. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it, yeah. And it's a, it's a system of layering. So I just, I layer the work up to get the detail. Um, but yeah, what, what I have found um, has happened because it does take so long is that opportunity for people to witness the progression and the process of the artwork has become really important. And the interactions that I'm able to have with the public is almost as important as the work itself. And that's something that I love because I think art, as I mentioned before, should be for absolutely everybody. And it's a really cool opportunity to get to do that. That is so exciting, actually. Yeah, I can totally understand that. You know, people are walking past you on their daily commute or, you know, whatever. That, that's fantastic actually you get to see the work progressing but also kind of like build up that confidence to start speaking to you as well right yeah I think so and I try to be really approachable you know anybody that I can feel that is watching or hovering or you know I always engage with absolutely everybody um I'm a poop I'm a people person and I've kind of missed that being on my own in the studio so whenever I do do my public pieces mm-hmm. I love engaging with everybody um whether it's somebody that's not enthusiast or it's somebody that knows absolutely nothing. And they'll just sort of sometimes say, Oh, I don't know anything about art, but I like that. And I said, but that's the best thing. That's like the pure natural response, you know, with no art history background, with no reasons as to why you might love or hate something. I Doesn't find that have, really interesting. Um, have, uh, what sort of references does your art have in terms of like art history and things? Then? Oh, I mean, I suppose with the brick pieces, with the camouflage pieces, there's some trompe l'oeil in there. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to really get that kind of camouflage blended in effect. Um, I'm really inspired by a lot of the Renaissance artists in how they paint with the layering, the detail, and that kind of stippling effect. Oh, cool. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the effect of light and shadow and all of that. So I think I feel like I paint traditionally, but the most con- in the most contemporary context, you know, yeah. on the most contemporary kind of subject matter. <laughs> I mean, I guess this is the thing, isn't it? It's like, what is street art, you know? I mean, is it just the placement of it on the street or is it actually more of a, a style and a, you know, a genre or whatever, yeah. I guess, right? Because typically you do associate that with, you know, sort of born out of a graffiti tradition. So it's actually quite ephemeral in that respect, right? It gets painted mm-hmm. over and um, cleaned up or whatever and then somebody else comes along, whereas obviously a lot of what you're doing, both from process and obviously some of them are commissioned and sanctioned right so they're going to stay for longer but yeah it's quite a thing are you sort of losing the street artist um handle these days or do you still use that when you're applying for commissions yeah no i like it i like both i think because i do different things i just yeah i feel almost like when i started on the street i didn't i almost felt like i wasn't worthy to be on the street if you know what i mean because there's these amazing street artists that can create these beautiful pieces so quickly um you know with their spray cans and everything and I sort of felt like I couldn't put myself within that bracket um but the longer I've been doing it the more confident I've become but I think I just want people to be aware that I do both maybe um and it's that crossover that really interests me but no definitely I'm very proud to say that I do you know I paint on the street and stuff it's just interesting to see different people's reactions when they're seeing me standing there with like a number one tiny paintbrush or (laughs) with my little paint palette and stuff. (laughs) 
And then um, yeah. so you've also shared with Curious Duke. So Duke, is that your, yeah. the same style of work, but, you know, obviously more, you know, and how, how would you say, it? smaller pieces, right, that could fit in the gallery. Is it the same style of work, or do you actually have a different um, aesthetic for the work that you show within the gallery space? Yeah, I mean, I have, um, so definitely show those pieces, so that whether it's pieces that have been created on the street or inspired by the street. Um, a lot of my stuff is very inspired by kind of modern day living. I kind of almost call them urban landscapes. So it's very, um, yeah, very much the aesthetic is kind of that 24-7 society, modernity. Um, so, yeah, they definitely have a selection of work that's within that same kind of body, I suppose. Um, but then where I've got my other theme of work, they that's kind of something completely different and it's that thing of being an artist can you can you do both and I, I believe you should because I think art should be about what speaks to you the most so I agree and I yeah. think you need to you know if you're working on that then you know you're always going to be having new ideas and sometimes you have to follow through on them to see where that takes you what about yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that because that's some sometimes people think you have to really stick to one theme and that's it but for me personally I'm interested in an artist who maybe does two or three different things, you know, and as long as I can see that their heart and the passion's there. So it's nice to hear you say that, you know, from your perspective. When you, you go back sort of decades or centuries, you know, the artists that we remember did work in multiple, um, you know, media. They had sort of different interests as they evolved through their career as different things happened in their life, even like using Picasso as an example. You know, I mean, his work... Yeah you know each decade is practically different he'd go to the south of france for the ceramics thing you know there was you know he was doing different things in different places i'd love to know what he'd be doing now with uh digital yeah. <laughs> <laughs> making movies or something probably um so, yeah exactly um about your other project well actually no first talk to me about um royce people what are you doing with them because that's happening in november of this year the next fair what are you? What are you what yeah, so, are you with them? so I mean, they're fantastic. I I consider them both friends as, as um, you know, as well as colleagues. But they're the only artist-led art fair. So both, you know, both Roy and Sam are artists themselves. And I think they saw that kind of gap in the market where they know how the artist works, you know, as well as doing the business and organisational side of it. And from an artist who's involved in it, that's really important because you really feel like you can relate you know, to the organisers and you can see that what is most important to them is the art and the artist, you know, above everything else. Um, so I've worked with them on both their previous art fairs. Um, I actually was able to do one of my brick projects live at the Oxo Tower. So I was creating one of the kind of camouflage pieces. So that was really cool. Really and was fun. that on the outside of the barge house or inside? Because, I mean, obviously it's got like great brick walls all the way through. Yeah, that was inside actually, and I had two different locations. So I was in between like floor, I think it was the second floor and the third floor. And then it was really nice because sort of by the end of it, people were looking at me thinking, what's she doing? She's just on a wall. But by that point, I'd already kind of camouflaged it in. So that was really nice. And it's kind of like that thing of own a piece of the Oxo Tower. Or, But they're really cool, fun, mm -hmm. easygoing, humble guys. Um, they're a pleasure to work with. They really, really are. So, yeah, so for the one coming up in November, so it's the 1st to the 4th of November, they're actually um, working with Centrepoint, um, the homeless charity. And I'm involved. So what we're doing is it's a really exciting um, collaboration. So my other theme of work, um, which is called Bipolar Picasso, it's where I create art installations of people who have experienced or suffered with mental illness. And obviously, unfortunately, a lot of people who are homeless either are homeless and then maybe develop a mental illness or it could be the other way around that because of their mental health struggles it might have caused them to become homeless um so straight away it just seemed like a real nice kind of you know just it made sense for this collaboration to go ahead so yeah i'm going to be creating one of my um, i haven't actually created a new piece for this it's been over a year um so i had my solo show um, in East London a couple of years ago and then kind of just needed a bit of a break from it, created a series of 10 paintings. This is going to be the first new addition to that series of work and we've already got the sitter in place. So yeah, that's going to go ahead and it's, um, 
yeah, it's just really interesting. It's it's portrait work, and it's also combined with um, an audio an audio piece as well. So it's a you're able to listen to the person speak about their innermost feelings and thoughts surrounding their experience with mental health, while looking directly at them at the portrait painting I've created. So is is the sitter that you've chosen one of the users of the Centre Point service? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, Gita. So it's somebody that. Um, well, she actually says Centre Point um, like saved her life and completely changed her life. And um, so she's come out the other end now and she's achieved some fantastic things. Her name's Catherine and she's, she's won awards that's been presented by um, Prince William. She now does talks. She writes articles and she goes back and helps other young people who, yeah, who suffer and struggle. So I'm really, I can't wait to, to have that first sitting with her. And I feel really honoured for her to be a part of the show. And that Roy's people out there are helping in, in, in doing this. And that's the kind of thing that I think stands them apart from everybody else, that they're interested in doing these really important passion projects, really, for, mm-hmm. for the bigger, the bigger good, not just, you know, what might benefit them or what have you. And then, so where does that happen? So is are you painting her live? Um, during the during the art fair, so um, the installation will be finished live on the opening night. So that's mm-hmm. Thursday, the, yeah, Thursday the first of November. So I'll be meeting her beforehand, doing all that preparatory work, working on the piece in the studio. But then it will be finished live on the first of November. So I'll be there painting it. So anybody that comes, definitely come and say hello. And that's again at the Octo Tower. Oh my goodness, that sounds so cool. And then what about the audio piece? Is that something you're recording while she is sitting for you or how, or have you collaborated with another sound artist for that portion of the project? Yeah, no, that's something that I do. So what happened, um, we just have a chat, almost like how me and you are having a chat now, just a really informal chat about her experiences. And I record that and that then gets edited and then that will become a piece. I mean, it was funny, it wasn't even initially intended to to be in that way um, I was just going to be a portrait but as I was meeting these amazing people the stories were just so important and I thought this has to somehow be a part of the work it kind of just grew really organically um, from that so yeah w- when I'm kind of when I do the sketches or the photographs and I'm just chatting along that will get recorded and be a part of it um, I think I read this statistic the other day said something silly like we look at a painting for like 10 seconds before we move on yeah so it's really cool that it gets you to really engage with the painting and more for the person as well because a lot of people feel like they're not heard there's still this huge stigma around mental illness a lot of people feel like they can't be as open for being judged by society yeah that was my uh, work in the public domain now around that isn't there um sort of making it acceptable to talk about and things which was always sort of brushed under the carpet what about yeah is there a, a follow-on after that? I mean, are you going to be doing another exhibition, like another, what would that be, a variation or evolution of the bipolar Picasso exhibition or what else? Yeah, I think so. I think it's going to be, um, I, just, I think after I do a few newer pieces, I think I'll be put on another show. So whether that will include some of the previous works or just the new works, I'm not too sure yet. But I would definitely want this to be, something that I continue to do yeah it's my passion project it's what means so much to me so in whatever way I can I want this to be something that I continually do alongside perhaps my other art with and it's no there's no pressure to it it's just something that I really feel like is really important so but yeah there definitely will be something else coming from it I've already got um um, actor Nicholas Pinnock on board so what I try to do is have celebrities alongside members of the public oh yeah um, that was predominantly because I was really frustrated with the way that the media only really cover it when it concerns a celebrity. And I felt like, what about all the other members of public that are suffering with mental health? So I wanted to use their celebrity status to then help you to understand somebody else's struggle. So for every celebrity I painted, for, this is for the initial project, I matched it by a member of the public. Because it's that thing of like, like, for example, Stephen Fry, we all agree that he's, amazing you know and eccentric and we all love him but if we were to find out our neighbor perhaps or our colleague had bipolar disorder we might be a bit more apprehensive and it's that weird 
it's just that weird relationship that we have you know why is it acceptable for somebody and somebody else maybe not so much so yeah. i've wanted to explore that within this yeah Wow, it sounds amazing. Well, I'm definitely going to be down at um, opening night for the art fair, so I'll definitely see you then if I don't see you before. Um, oh, brilliant. <laughs> and so going back to your street art, where can people see your work? Where is it in, on permanent display? So um, I actually do a lot of stuff in, in Southwark. So um, in Paisley Park in Kennington, there's actually three permanent pieces there. Um, there's two utility boxes which are on just the right outside the park and there's also a, f a flagpole which I've um, <laughs> which I've done in kind of giraffe print to echo the fact that Paisley Park used to be a zoo. Oh my god did um, it? Like in Central yeah. Well another zoo. Wow. Yeah. yeah it's really interesting so both the pieces I've done there one features a meerkat one features a leopard they're both part of my brick project they're both camouflaged into the surroundings so you wouldn't initially even notice them except for seeing you know the animals kind of peering out or seeming to pounce out at you um i've got another uh, mural which is just at um the park that surrounds the imperial war museum so that was i renovated yeah i renovated a mural that used to be there and the other one which i think is kind of my one of my proudest moments is the telephone box that's on southampton row in bloomsbury that's a permanent art installation to promote cleaner air and more green in London. And it's actually locked. And if you, if you look inside, I've painted the exact constellation of stars that we should be able to see from that point in London if we had cleaner air. <laughs> wow. I know. I was in Rome so, in, uh, at the start of July and it was amazing, like, you know, sitting outside after dark, you really could see the stars, which is just so impossible in London. That is sure. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And so it's a nice opportunity for you to be able to sort of stargaze in central London. <laughs> and again, it highlights that, that we should, like, wow, we should be able to see this if we had less light pollution and air pollution. This is something we should be able to witness. So it's just bringing that to the forefront of people's minds, I suppose. And again, making it interactive, as I think art should be, should be able to engage with it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, what about, so, um, as an artist, sort of producing work in the public domain, because, you know, I've done some work with Campbell Arts Festival, and when we're looking for artists, we always do a call-out. But how do you find your gigs? Do you apply to call-outs, or is it just through networks, or do you spend a lot of time researching? Or do you even pitch to, um, you know, potential what, venues and councils and things like that? Um, I would say earlier on, I did a lot of open calls. I did a lot of applying and application forms and stuff. And then thankfully, as years have gone on, um, I feel like I don't have to do that as much at the moment. And I'm approached more on whether it's word of mouth or different galleries I've worked with and stuff. But yeah, it's a combination of both. But I think at the moment, it seems to be people that have maybe seen my work and want to collaborate and work together. And I think it's just that thing of just... You never know what opportunities around the corner. So I try to be really open to everything. And yeah, and when it works, it works. And just see what happens, really. And is most just of your work in London as well? I mean, I know you're based in London, but is every, pretty much most of what you're doing here as well? Yeah, it is at the moment. It's something I'd like to expand, I think, maybe one day. But yeah, I'm London born and raised. So for me, this is sort of the perfect place to explore and create any pieces in. Oh, brilliant. Or anything else you want yeah. to talk about? I think just the thing of, yeah, just um, so you can see me creating the piece live on the opening night for Royce People Art Fair, which again is on the Thursday, the 1st of November. And the tickets are free and you can get that from RoycePeopleArtFair.com. It's going to be a really exciting event. Lots of amazing artists. There's definitely an art fair that you wouldn't want to miss. And where can people find you online? Um, so I've got my Instagram, which is Andrea underscore Tiramos. And also my Twitter and my website, which at the moment needs to be updated. So probably the social media handles at the moment, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew, so much for being a guest on the podcast. And I can't wait to see you soon. Uh, thank you so much, Gita. It's been so lovely chatting with you.